Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Hockey Sense. I'm Chris Peters, and it is one episode number 135, which means it is the final episode of Talking Hockey Sense. If you didn't know, uh, we are moving on to a new show after this one. Uh, we've got a holiday week coming up next week, and also I will be out at the CHL USA Top Prospects game. So uh, this is it for Talking Hockey Sense. After 135 episodes, we will talk a little bit today about the World Junior Championship. We will talk about that CHL USA Top Prospects Challenge. Um, and we'll also answer your questions for one final time. But uh, I will let you know that we do have a new show coming here in the next couple of weeks. We will have a new co-host, a new title, uh, new everything. And it is going to be uh, a little bit different, but hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, and follow along as you have enjoyed this one uh, for a few years now. And really, uh, we'll talk a little bit later in the podcast about what this show has meant to me uh, and what you all have meant to me as listeners. But uh, today, we're going to you know, continue business as usual, do what we do on this show, make sure we close out with a bang with some good analysis and hopefully uh, some good answered questions and get you ready for our next show. And you'll be able to see the announcement about that on Flow Hockey in the next couple of weeks. So uh, make sure you are subscribed to Flow Hockey if you haven't already to get all that great hockey action that we've had. And it allows us to continue to do shows like this and the new one that is on the way. But we're going to focus a bit today on, on the matters at hand, the prospect world as we know it. Obviously, last week we talked a lot about the NCAA and the CHL ruling. Got a lot of feedback from that podcast and have heard Plenty more, and there's going to be plenty more to learn about that, but we won't uh, spend as much time on that today as we did last week, so make sure you go back and listen to that one if that's a topic that you're passionate about or want to know more about because it is a complicated one. But we're going to go, and you know, we're about a month out or five weeks or so out from the World Junior Championship. So I'm going to take the opportunity to do what I've always done. And obviously, the World Juniors is such a big event for me, and we are going to talk today about Team USA's roster and the options they have available to them for this World Junior Championship. And I think that, you know, the World Juniors, of course, December 26th through January 5th. This year it's in Ottawa, so you've got the added bonus of, of, of being on Canadian soil. So you get good times for games, but you also get uh, a raucous atmosphere, and certainly with Team USA and Canada playing against each other on the same side of the bracket uh, this year, that makes it even more fun. We know we will see those two teams match up on New Year's Eve to close out the year. Few better ways to close out the hockey uh, calendar year with that game between the U.S. and Canada. So let's talk a bit about Team USA and the options they have available to them. First of all, Team USA, the defending champions of the World Junior Championship, they have never won back-to-back -back gold medals. And I can tell you, based on spending time with some of the players over the summer at their World Junior Camp, this is a very committed group to going after that repeat title. On top of that, they've got their head coach in David Carl, who has yet to lose a game this season with Denver. They play uh, this upcoming weekend against Arizona State. They are currently 12-0, and 0, and so obviously – uh, the head coach is going to be coming in hot. Uh, one of their top defensemen, Z Booyam, is going to be coming in hot uh, the way that Denver has played. So we will definitely uh, be intrigued to see how that translates. But really, it comes back to the team on the ice. And there's a few kind of outstanding things that we need to get to. So the first and foremost thing is what will happen with Will Smith. Now, Will Smith has four points in his NHL, a young NHL career. He's been playing for the San Jose Sharks. And, you know, Usually when a player is struggling as he has, um, you, you wonder, hey, maybe it's he can go play at the World Juniors, maybe go to the AHL, you know, do kind of the Shane Wright thing uh, of a couple of years ago. I don't think that's necessarily the route that San Jose is going to take. And I've been given some indications, um, nothing definitive, but it, it just sounds to me like Team USA will not have Will Smith available to them for this tournament, which I think in the end, as much as that is a, a loss and it is a loss, but as much as it is, it's more about the um, it's more it's more about what they do have. And, and they still have a really talented group. And that starts with Gabe Perot. 
and Ryan Leonard. I think this this team is very much their team. Um, and I'd say, you know, more definitively, it's Ryan Leonard's team. I think that, you know, in the way that last year's team was Rucker McGroarty's team, this year it's all about Ryan Leonard. And so I think up front, when we talk about the forwards for this team, Ryan Leonard and Gabe Perot are going to be the center of everything. And then you've got James Hagens, who has been playing on the same line with them more at Boston College this season, um, you know, in as that number one center. So the top NHL draft prospect, for this season is Team USA's likely number one center. After that top line, there's a lot of question marks in terms of you know how you're going to structure the team. I think you would look at Oliver Moore and Danny Nelson as clear locks, guys that were on the team last year, guys that can help you in a lot of different ways. But you're not you're, you don't have as many returnees at that point to fill some of those other holes. Uh, Kerry Terrance was on the team last year, but didn't end up playing. I still think the way that he's played this season, the OHL, the camp that he had, I think he's a great candidate to play down USA's lineup, give them speed, give them some tenacity. And as we talked with with Kerry when when we were in uh, at the World Junior Camp, you know, this is a very meaningful tournament for him because uh, growing up, he he went to a lot of Ottawa Senators games in the building that they will now be competing in. Um, so, you know, I think he's got that added bonus to it there. So what's going to be real interesting is to see how Team USA decides to structure their forward group after the Perot, Hagens, and Leonard line. And, you know, based on the performances that we've seen throughout college hockey this year, I think Cole Eiserman has put himself in a really good position to be on this team. I, you know, I think he was on the bubble coming out of the summer camp. And I think more and more to watch the way that he's played for Boston University, um, you know, he might do one thing, uh, but he does it super well and that score goals and i think he's starting to get more um you know he's he's engaging more physically you're seeing a little bit more from that i think he can play a top six role potentially on this team um and and certainly be a top power play guy for this team uh and give that secondary scoring because i do think that perot Hagens, and and leonard line are more than capable of carrying the mail and certainly a line that i think would be very difficult to contain Beyond that, you know, Oliver Moore has had a slow start offensively this season. I'm not really concerned about that because I think he's going to play a variety of different roles for Team USA. He's going to be a, a penalty killer. You know, he can play uh, at center. He can play on the wing. He can do a lot of different things. I still think that he's a valuable guy that they're going to lean on. But then, you know, you look at say, OK, well, what else is there going to be? Quentin Musty is a really interesting candidate for this team. He had an okay camp in the summer. Um, and I think, you know, the fact is he sat out most of the season waiting for a trade from Sudbury that never came. And now he is uh, back playing. He is producing. He's doing all the things that he needs to do. I'm sure that the, the motivation to play for this world junior team was part of it. And I think based on if he had not gotten back in the lineup, I think it would have been a very difficult team for him to make. Now that he is playing again, I think you have to at least get him into camp um, unless you feel real strongly that he doesn't fit what you're doing. But I think that with his size, his scoring ability, um, he's going to be an attractive player to potentially include. Um, another big question mark is going to be that of Trevor Connolly. Now, Connolly has been injured for parts of this season. Um, he did have a, a recent you know, swath of, of, of major penalty, uh, had a major penalty, which is a reminder of kind of what can happen um, with, with Trevor Connolly. He has 21 penalty minutes in just six games so far. Um, and and that is the thing that I think is is the what cause for pause, if you will, if you're David Carl and Team USA staff, Trevor Connolly, um, all the talent in the world, but there have been some decisions made on the ice. You know, you know, go back to the under 18 World Championship last year, um, you know, where where maturity has has been an issue. And so when you see that, you know, you say this guy on talent alone is a top six forward all day for this group. And he very well still could be. But the risk that you run in a short tournament is you have a player that commits a bad penalty, commits a major penalty, gets suspended, any things like that. And this is something that there's a track record for and you have to be mindful of. But I do think that Austin, uh, that uh, sorry, Trevor Connolly is very much in the mix for this team. So, when you look at the rest of the lineup, you know, I think those are the players that are going to have some of the strongest discussions, but they're certainly not the only ones. Um, you, you know, you look at players and how they've played this year. Austin Bernovic, who has had a very surprising start to his season. He's been, you know, and, and, and that he's coming off of a, just a tremendous USHL season a year ago uh, as a goal scorer, now playing for St. Cloud State, and he has 11 points at 11 games. He's got size. He's got ability, um, you know, and, and also Brett Larson, 
head coach of St. Cloud State, is on the staff for Team USA. He's getting an up-close and personal look. I think if you came out of summer camp, Brnovic would not have been in your plans. I think based on how he's played now, you have to consider him. Um, you know, you look at other guys up front. Uh, Brandon Svoboda, who had such a great camp. He's got size. He's got skating ability. He's not producing so far this year. You know, is that a player that you're going to bring um, when he's not playing? And, and what role would he play? I think ultimately that's a fourth-line player for your team here but he also has some scoring pop. So I, I do think he's still very much in the mix. Uh, I mentioned Danny Nelson, Kerry Terrance. I think those are probably your bottom two centers, um, the two guys that that will play uh, PK and give you some some good minutes down there. I think Danny Nelson is, is really coming to his own as a player um, and can fit a variety of roles that Team USA needs. Brody Zemer is having a solid season so far with uh, Minnesota. Uh, he had a tremendous summer camp, so that's another player where I think he's got to be kind of in your mix somewhere um, and, and, and makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Max Plant came off of an injury. Uh, he is back in the lineup for, for Minnesota Duluth, so I think that's a player that you certainly are going to consider still. Uh, Beckett Hendrickson. Um, you know, Zach Naring is another name that I want to bring up as well. So Naring was not in summer camp. There's always a player that kind of comes in. And now Naring is a Winnipeg Jets prospect. He is at Western Michigan University. He's playing very well. That's a player that I say, okay, well, this is what this this final camp and this camp I believe will be announced probably in early December. Well, that the and then the camp will be held in mid December and then they go to Canada. Um, so you know I think that the way that he's played, especially of late, Naring, it's a guy you want to see what he looks like with the group. So that's a player I would certainly be bringing into camp if 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 it were me making some of these decisions. Other players: Teddy Stiga, Tanner Adams, AJ Spalacy, Joey Willis. I think there's a lot of guys that are playing well enough to have a, a case made for them. I think they could potentially be there in the end, um, but it's just a matter, you know, the, and, and, you know, Chris Pelosi, others that, you know, they that, that were good in summer camp. Those are all players that I think you, you can consider, but when you build the bottom of this lineup, you also, I think have to be mindful of the fact that, you know, you're trying to go for the, the gold medal. You're trying to go for that first ever repeat, but you're also got to be thinking about maybe having some of those younger players, guys like Zemer, like, uh, uh, like Stiga that will be there next year. Um, as, as you host the tournament in Minneapolis, St. Paul in the following year. So I think that having some of those players matters as well. But but I think for this staff, especially David Carl, who is accustomed to winning, who has a world junior and a couple of national championships in his belt uh, or, on, you know, in his in his trophy cabinet already. You want to keep going and you want to try to take the best team you possibly can. So you maybe don't think as much about the future of the tournament so much as you think about right now. And I think there are enough players, um, you know, with Hagen's Iserman, um, others that, you know, you're going to be able to get some of that experience. All right, let's quickly move to the defense and the defense I think is, is even tougher to predict because there are a lot of options and not as many great, amazing, like guys that you're just like, Absolutely, this guy has to be on the team. Um, I do, however, think, you know, Zeev Booyam is one of those players. He is absolutely on the team. Uh, Drew Fortescue, I think he's absolutely on the team. That very well might be your top pairing. Um, those guys will, will probably play uh, the lion's share of the minutes. I'm, I'm guessing we'll see Zeev Booyam out on the ice about 27 minutes a game um, based on how he has performed so far this season, how he performed last year. And it's not just the offensive game that he's brought to the table. He has shown the ability to play defense as well. Really impressed with that. Drew Fortescue, solid defensively, not producing a ton, but he's a guy that I think he gives you good, solid minutes. He's going to be a good matchups guy. He allows Eve Booyum to play a little bit more free um, and let him get up the ice a little bit more. That's important. Um, I, based on what we've seen so far this season, I think Cole Hudson comes in and he's going to play the role uh, similar to what Brother Lane played last year. And I think, you know, he is going to be a, a top four defenseman for this team. I think he's going to be the second power play unit guy uh, with Booyam being the top power play unit guy. And I think that's going to make a big difference. I love the way Hudson's moving the puck. He's scoring goals. He's getting involved in the play. Uh, defensively, the, there have been some hiccups here and there, but I think he's still uh, getting used to the college game, and he's doing it very well. He's transitioned quite solidly to the game, and I, I think he's a, quite a player so far. After that, after those three players, I think it's kind of a, a, a pick em at this point. EJ Emery, uh, with his track record with USA Hockey, with his ability to defend, with his skating ability, with his size, 
I think he's a guy that you, you want to have in the mix in some way. Same thing with Adam Kleber. He hasn't produced this year, hasn't put up a lot of points at Minnesota Duluth, but he is an all day. You know, you can pl- probably have him as a as a matchups defenseman. He can play in your top four if you need him to. He moves pucks competently. Um, it's just you know you you may not get a lot of offensive capabilities from him. Another guy that's having a great season, Paul Fisher at Notre Dame. He had a very strong camp, and I had him on my roster initially. Um, I think he's going to stay that way. The question is going to be, do you take both him and Zach Schultz, two guys that played a long time, you know, played the NTDP, have won an under-18 world championship, um, you know, play a very, very, very similar style. Um, can you afford to have two guys like that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, so then that makes it when you have that, you're starting to run out of room for players. I think Aaron Manettian is another guy who was on the team last year, didn't get a chance to play, didn't have a great summer camp, but he's played pretty well for Boston College, which has been one of the best teams in the country. He plays a lot of minutes for them. I think that's another guy you have to keep in your mix for camp. As far as other players to potentially invite, I would say Logan Hensler. Um, it, you know, he's kind of been up and down a little bit at Wisconsin. Wisconsin themselves have been up and down. That's a player to kind of consider. Um, but I think there's a number of other guys that you could potentially bring in, and maybe there's a few that I'm not even seeing You know, in terms of, uh, of, of players that, that make sense for you uh, down the road here. So we'll have to see. But I think defense is going to be one of those where it's a little bit tougher to predict. I'll be interested to see how many defensemen they bring into their winter camp um, you know, right before the tournament because I think that's going to be a position – of uh of question goaltending no questions there i mean trey augustine is the number one goalie i think hampton slakinski is locked down the number two position even though he's been splitting time at, at western michigan when he has played he's played extremely well and then the real question is is who's going to be the number three goalie um and i think in this case you do go with the youth you do go with forward looking you go with nick kemp from notre dame um you know a guy that's splitting starts as well or not playing as much but i still think that that's a player that you want to bring um, with you because he is very likely going to be in the mix next year. So that's kind of a quick and dirty look at, at, at where things stand as we start seeing what that camp roster is going to look like. I'm sure there are players that I'm missing. There is always two to three surprises among the the invites, players that you know were not in summer camp, players that were not drafted, you know, other things like that. Um, and we saw it last year, and we saw some of those players that did get in those invites to camp get drafted later in the year. So um, there's always possibilities there. But I think some of the guys that are to look at for, you know, that maybe weren't on the radar before or at least weren't in camp, you know, Trevor Connolly wasn't in camp due to injury. Um, Austin Bernovic is, is is a player that I don't think anybody really put on this team in the summer, but really could now. Um, you know, we'll see Quentin Musty. The fact that he's playing is helpful, but it doesn't mean that he's a lock for the roster, I don't think. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that as well. And then just some of these other players that are kind of filtering in that could potentially be part of it. I think USA has every reason to believe that they'll be the favorite going in. Canada is going to have a loaded roster. Sweden's going to have a very talented roster. But the U.S. have every reason to believe that they should be able to take the gold medal. And I, I'm really excited to see how that team comes together. Um, I, I will not be in the winter camp this year. Usually I am there, but I'm not able to go this season. But uh, will be at the World Junior Championship with our team from Flow, and we will have coverage wall-to-wall of the World Junior Championship, really starting now with this podcast and this uh not not quite roster projection, but roster status update, we'll call it. Um, and so that's that's really you know my my favorite time of the year. Super excited to get it going um, and, and really bear down on the World Juniors because that is coming up. And uh, as we have for the last two years here at Flow Hockey, we will cover it wall to wall with a, a special focus on Team USA, but also. Um, you know, coverage of the tournament as a whole. So you, we will be a place where you can see a lot of different content on the World Junior Championship. We cannot wait to bring it to you, and we will very soon. All right, moving on. We are going to talk a little bit about what's coming up next week, Tuesday and Wednesday in Canada, the CHL USA Top Prospects Challenge. I will be there. Uh, I will be at uh, both games. Uh, I will be flying home on Thanksgiving. So Pearson Airport, don't let me down. Uh, I need to get home so I can get some of that good turkey. Um, But let's talk a little bit about the rosters. And, you know, the roster, we did talk about that already a couple weeks ago. But, um, you know, the the CHL roster is going to be led by Porter Martone. And I I think, you know, there's there's a growing groundswell. My friend Corey Promen has put Porter Martone as the number one player on the draft. I'm not there yet. I still have James Hagen's there. We don't have our, our, our list will come out after this event. 
Um, you know, it's just been kind of delayed with all the other things we've had going on at Flow, but we will uh, get that out there. But, you know, Porter Martone, I think, is going to be really the focal point. Um, I think he's probably going to make Canada's World Junior team as well, and this will be kind of the last little kind of way for him to prove himself, but I, I don't think he has much left to prove with how he's played this season. Um, that CHL team is going to be loaded. I think on a talent basis, um, you know, this was not the best year for this CHL versus the NTDP. Uh, the the U18 team has struggled this year. They have six wins so far this season. Um, they have, uh, of the games they played against NCAA opponents, they've won one of those games, and that was against Robert Morris. Um, and, and so that's there is some concern there. On top of that, there this NTDP team has been dealt another blow. Uh, Carter Amico, uh, who is on, really, he's been an outstanding player um, and, and has a ton of upside and has size and does all these things, a good skater. Um, he is out for the season, uh, unfortunately. A bad timing there for him, obviously, in his draft season. But even more so, you know, for Team USA and and to lose such an important player. Uh, the good news is that LJ Mooney has returned to the lineup. He did play earlier this week, and so uh, LJ Mooney is such an important piece of that team. And I think they missed him badly as he was out uh, after sustaining an injury against Notre Dame in one of the college games. So he is back in the lineup, hopefully healthy and ready to go. I believe there could be some outside additions to this team. I have not yet heard who that will be, but because of injuries and other roster openings, we could see a couple of players um, uh, that are familiar to NHL draft watchers um, that will be potentially added to Team USA. I have not gotten confirmation, however, that that will happen. But I do think that you know the CHL team on a talent basis is 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 definitely a significantly more talented team. The the advantage the NTDP has is that they've played together all year and you know at least should have that chemistry and the ability to push back. So I do think we're going to have competitive games. Um, but boy, the talent level and the the number of high end draft picks on Team CHL is going to be a lot higher um, in this particular game. And it's not just about Martone. I think Caleb Desnoyers is going to be a guy that we're going to watch, and and he's going to have an opportunity here to really prove himself on a big stage. Same with Michael Misa. You know, I think Misa is a guy. You know, if he ends up, he's played out of his mind this season. And I think that's a really great thing for for him at this point. He's taken another step forward. This event, I think, will allow us to at least get a kind of a look at him in terms of how much further ahead he has put himself in the discussion for, you know, top five, top seven, you know, is he a top three pick? Um those are the things that we could potentially be talking about. Matthew Schaefer, healthy, ready to go. Another player that's just like, hey, could he potentially even make Canada's roster for the World Juniors? You look at that decor, and they've got a lot of talent. If he were to find a way to make that team after – playing so well at the under 18 worlds last year, captaining the Helenka Gretzky team. Um, and then, you know, playing as he did uh, so far since he's gotten healthy, you know, that's another one. I think the goaltending is also going to be very strong for that CHL team as well. Uh, those games will be on, uh, I believe CHL.TV and the NHL network in the U S TSN will be carrying it. Um, we will be providing some on-site coverage. I plan to do some interviews with players on both sides of the equation here. We'll be talking NHL draft. And as we will throughout the entire season, we will be talking NHL draft with these players and with, uh, uh, with you. And we will be providing a ton of content. We've got draft rankings coming out soon. Uh, but those two games, Wednesday or Tuesday and Wednesday night, Tuesday in London, Wednesday in Oshawa, I will be uh, driving across Ontario to bring that to you right before American Thanksgiving. So really cannot wait to get out there and see what this event is all about. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So as I mentioned, this is the last show. So, uh, of course, I, I have to do what we do most shows, and that is to do a final Q&A. So this is a bit of a grab bag. There's a lot of different topics at hand. There's World Juniors. There is NHL Draft. There is AHL. There is a lot of other things that we've got going on here. So uh, we are just going to scatter shoot it with, right along with these questions. I really, really appreciate all the great questions. I cannot say it enough. The people that have asked questions on this show are super informed. They are often very thought-provoking questions for me. They're fun to answer, and that just goes to show that we have a very educated um, and, and very uh, engaged 
fan base here and listener base, and you guys have helped make this show uh, a lot of fun. So let's get to our final Talking Hockey Sense Q&A, and Alex is going to start us off. And Alex has a good question that also I like because it allows me to sing the praises of, of flow hockey a little bit. Who's a prospect in the AHL people should be talking more about? Well, there are always a lot of prospects in the AHL, and obviously you can see them on Flow Hockey. It's been great to have the AHL this season. It has been great for me to get to more AHL rinks, and I was just at the Iowa Wild versus Texas Stars game where I was doing color commentary with Ben Gislason uh, on Flow Hockey, and so that was a lot of fun for me, and I got to see a lot of prospects there. However, I think in terms of the prospects that we're not talking enough about from the AHL, you know, it's it's often we, we look at the players and we say, you know, first round draft picks like Konsta Hellenius, Artem Levshinov, Frank Nazer, um, you know, players like that. But but it's uh, oftentimes the AHL is going to be a place where prospects come into their own and they really start to flourish. Um, and, and I think that the guy that has flourished in a way that has exceeded my expectations this year is a player that is fresh out of college was the top free agent last year, and he's now gone from producing at a high level in college to producing at a high level in the in the AHL. And he is currently tied for the AHL scoring lead. And I don't think, you know, I we've, we've been talking about him on Flow Hockey, but I don't know that people realize that Colin Graff, who was the number one free agent on my list for undrafted players last year, has 19 points through his first 14 professional or for, first 14 AHL games this season. 1.36 points per game, 5 goals scored, 14 assists. He has been all over it and you know the thing that has struck me about Colin Graff is I think he's been on a very interesting path. You go back, he was in the NCDC with the Boston Junior Bruins, you know, did not get drafted, got a little bit overlooked. He produced a lot there, but then he goes to Union first. So he goes to Union College, has a very strong freshman season. Then he goes to Quinnipiac, and that's where things really took off for him. Over the last two seasons that he played, he had 59 points as a sophomore, 49 points as a junior. Elite-level playmaker, high-end thinker of the game, moves well. Not the biggest guy, you know, a little bit on the slider side, but he has started to bulk up. He has started to uh, really bear down, and now I, we're seeing Colin Graff and I, I just realized I never said the team that he's on, the San Jose Barracuda, uh, who have been one of the real good stories of this season. The Barracuda have not often been one of the top teams, but as the San Jose Sharks struggle, the San Jose Barracuda have flourished, and they flourish because of players like Colin Graff, who is currently leading that team in scoring and now leading all rookies in the AHL in scoring. Now, as a undrafted free agent, only 22 years old, um, now, you know, just turned 22. So he was a young undrafted free agent and that gives him a little more runway. I think what the Sharks should do, and this is more of a commentary. I've said this before. We said this on the Will Smith episode, the San Jose Sharks are not going to win a lot at the NHL level. They need to try to win hockey games. They need to make sure that they don't get, you know, their heads kicked in too much here, but at the AHL level, if this can be a team that competes for a Calder team, Calder Cup, if this is a team that can go down the wire and be one of the best teams in the AHL, that is only going to help the NHL team. And it's only going to work if you keep those players there, keep them playing, keep them in the roles that you hope and expect them to play at the NHL level. Colin Graff has been a top-line player in the AHL. If he ever wants to be a top-line player in the NHL, he has to succeed in the AHL. He's checking that box right now. Really impressed with him. I think that more people in the hockey world should be taking note of what Colin Graff is doing, because I think there were expectations that there could be a drop off from him coming from college, and it there has not been. So we'll see how the season progresses. But Colin Graff is the guy I want to talk about there. All right, our next question comes to us from George, and George asks here, "What's different with Sam Dickinson this year to explain the uptick in production?" You know, I I think. For me, it's more of a natural progression for Sam Dickinson. I think that's been kind of the 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 real thing here that we've seen is that um is that there is a lot of uh maturity that has come. Uh, I think there is the fact that he is only stronger. 
uh, than he was last season. I think his his shot volume is increasing, and that has allowed him to score more goals this year. And I feel like, and maybe you know, it'd be interesting to see. I feel like Sam Dickinson, the London Knights are more his team now than they were even a year ago. Um, and now in his third OHL season, I think you're just seeing the natural progression of a player that's aging um, and, and developing. And this is pretty common, I think, for top level. When when the London Knights have top level players, the progression is so rapid for them. And it's usually because, yes, the team is very good around them. But you look at guys like like Evan Bouchard, you you go back to you know Easton Cowan, who's still there now, and and, and what he has done as the years have progressed. Those top level players, they get every little bit out of them. And, and that's to me where we're seeing Sam Dickinson take that that next step. You know, I've always had some, you know, general concerns about overall hockey sense. Those are melting away more and more. As he gets more experience, he knows what works, he knows what doesn't. He's 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 been more efficient, I feel like, as well this year. Watching players as they get ready for the World Junior Championship. This is a guy that, you know, is on Canada all day. It seems to be should be a lock for the team and should be a guy that's going to play a lot of minutes for them. Um, you look at the size, the athleticism, and now the production, which was there last year. I mean, 70 points last year, but already at 30 points in just 17 games so far this season. He is on another level. He is continuing to move forward, you know, on pace for 40 goals and 100-plus points. I mean, absolutely ridiculous numbers. Well, I don't know if that'll necessarily uh, stay that way, but this is all of a sudden Sam Dickinson's show, and – I think the San Jose Sharks, who we just talked about, are going to be really excited because they are building something with Macklin Celebrini, with Will Smith, with you know guys like Colin Graff who who matriculate up. But then you have those others, Dickinson, Yaroslav Askarov. You know, so many players are going to be playing a role in the next phase of the San Jose Sharks, and they, the future is very bright. So, patience with that team because the the good times are coming. All right, our next question comes from Maxime, and Maxime would like to ask about a Montreal Canadiens prospect. And where do you see Michael Hage in the Habs lineup in the future? Is he a lock in Montreal's top six? You know, Maxime, great question. Michael Hage is having a great start to his season um, with the uh, University of Michigan. Um, I think that he has put himself on the map here. He's a point-per-game player, uh, nine uh, nine points in nine games. He uh, has... Uh, missed a little bit of time recently as well, um, so there's that. But I do think overall um, it's a real positive showing for him so far this season. In terms of being a lock for the top six, to be a top six forward in the NHL, it's very difficult to project those players out. Um, and And because there are so many factors that come into play. I think with what Montreal is building, and you look at the Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield, Ivan Demidov, you know, Michael Hage has got to be a, a member of that group of the next phase. He is fast enough for sure. He is a, a bona fide scorer. The questions will be, does he do all the other things? You know, his off puck play still can, is, is, is getting better, uh, but it still needs to improve more. Um, is he going to be a top, you know, is he a center at the next level or is he a wing? I personally think that he's probably going to end up on the wing. Um, I, I think that that, you know, especially with how, you know, watching some of the games that, that he played for Chicago last year, he was much more kind of a wing in the defensive zone and a center everywhere else. And so, you know, I think that that's kind of what we'll see is that he, he's probably going to end up there. Um, I do think, you know, top nine all day for me. I think he's an NHL player. I think his NHL skating ability, I think he's got good hockey sense. It's all about coming down to having good habits, creating consistency, um, and, and just having that 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 drive that you need to have to be a top six forward. But his progression is outstanding. He's still just 18 years old. He'll turn 19 at the end of the college season. Um, you know, and and he's got a guy, a, a guy with a lot of runway. I don't know if you know, I don't know if he'll end up on Canada's radar for the world junior team this year. That would be nice, but I think, you know, more than likely he'll be in the mix for that team next year. Um, but, but boy, Michael Hage, I mean, you, you think about all the things that he's been through in his young life so far, losing his father so tragically last year, but, but to, to bounce back the way that he has, you know, on the ice and, you know, I'm sure there's always going to be emotional uh, things that, that come with that and, and that, that loss, but to see him, um, flourish at the university of Michigan and take a team like, you know, Michigan, I had pretty low expectations for the Wolverines this year. Um, they've exceeded my expectations. And a lot of it has to do with Michael Hage 
saying, okay, this can be my team now. I can do this. Um, and, you know, with with the way that he scored goals this year and the way that he's taken charge in certain games, I'm really excited to see where he goes next. So uh, do I think he can be a top six forward? Absolutely. He has that potential. He has that upside. Um, will he be is, is going to be up to him from the next couple stages. Does he go stay at Michigan for another year after this year? Does he sign? He's got a lot of options in front of him. Um, you know, I think we'll, we'll wait and see where he's at in April and see what what makes the most sense then. All right. Our next question comes from Kenneth, and Kenneth would like to know, what are your thoughts on Edward Shala in this season now that he's in the AHL after a down season in the OHL? Okay. So Shala has been a bit of a, uh, uh, an, a polarizing prospect at times, um, you know, basically because he had – a real nice pre-draft career. You know, he he played in um he played played in in the Czech League, you know, produced well, had a good under 18 worlds, was at the U20s, and then you know came to the OHL and it just didn't seem to click for him. He still had a good you know, good enough world juniors, he had points, but he didn't necessarily play that well. Um and you know, his numbers were were fair at the OHL level. This year, I feel like we're seeing more of the Edward Shala pre-draft than we are than we have seen before. He's almost a point per game. I have watched Coachella Valley a few times. He's engaged in the games. He's getting involved offensively. And I do think this is a resurgent season for him. Um, he has not looked overmatched by the physicality of the league. He has not looked overmatched by the pace of the league. And I do think that last year was an adjustment period for him going from Czech League to North America and, and to playing for, you know, the Coachella Valley Firebirds or f- for the Kitchener Rangers and and Barry Colts as he did over the course of last season, and he needed that adjustment period. Now I feel like he's adjusted and he's made significant strides toward um, being a better pro. You know, I I, I think that there's going to be still some growing pains. I I don't you know like will he live up to first round billing? Will he be a bona fide NHL player? He still has to prove a bit more. Last year I was very concerned about his overall pro prospects. This year I'm far less concerned about it because he's doing it at the AHL level. To to play in that league at 19 years old is not easy. But we've seen more and more players if they are of a good enough caliber of a player. They are going to produce at the AHL level. They're going to make things happen, and they are going to get opportunities. And so I think this is a player that has taken the opportunity that's in front of him, and he has taken it and run with it. And I really think there's a lot to like about where he is right now, where he has the potential to go. And I think if you're a Seattle Kraken fan, you can breathe a little bit easier about his pro prospects because I do think that he is taking a a big step. But he's got three goals, six assists through 10 games so far this season. You know, and I think that's a really good place for him to be as a rookie. Um, you know, that definitely puts him in, in, a, in a good class with the U20 players in the league right now. Um, so that is a player that I think has, 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 you know, turned a corner, at least in the early stage of this season. We'll see how the rest of the year progresses. All right, let's take a look here at our next question. This one comes from Jake, and Jake asks, how do you feel about the crop of American World Junior eligible goalies uh, how how they've done this year. It seems obvious that Trey Augustine will be the starter, but who goes behind him? Who starts for the U.S. next year? Well, yeah, I think, you know, you're always looking ahead. And and so Trey Augustine is about to start his third World Juniors. He's been a, he's, he's played in games in three World Juniors. Um, you know, not a lot of goalies have done that. Um, and, and certainly he's a guy that, you know, we kind of expected would would be in that mix. He, you know, played games as an underager in his draft season. Uh, he essentially wrestled the job away uh, and was the starter, didn't have the best uh, start in the semifinals that year. Then last year, he leads Team USA to the gold medal. He also won an under-18 gold medal, and he has been lights out as a collegiate goalie for the last two seasons. And in the games that I've watched Michigan State this year, he's a big reason that they are now the number two team in the country. So that is a player that I got a lot of time for, a player that I got a lot to to look forward to with. Um, so that is a player that I think, you know, he, if he starts every game, I wouldn't be shocked. Maybe they get in there. I do think Hampton Slikinski is the clear number two goalie for this team this year. And, and Slikinski has done 
a really nice job at Western Michigan when called upon. Um, you know, he's in. A, he, he did transfer or didn't transfer, but he, he was committed to Northern Michigan. They had a coaching change. He goes and changes to Western Michigan. They've been able to give him four starts so far. He's two one and one um, with a nine forty four save percentage. Uh, meanwhile, he's been in tandem with Cam Rowe, who has been the incumbent starter there. And so you you, you know, I think Slikinski. Uh, they've they've each started four games. Western has been one of the real hot starting teams in the country this year. Um, so, you know, both Rowe and Slikinski have played really well. Slikinski did get the game against Boston College and, and kept Western in that game. That is their only uh, full loss this season. Um, so that is a team that I think will be continuing to watch. Uh, and Sl- Hampton Slikinski is number two. In terms of who's going to be the starter in a couple of years, that's where things get a little bit more interesting because you've got Nick Kempf, who you know played at the NTDP last year, um, was their goalie at the World Under 18s. I thought he played really well in the summer camp this uh, this summer. He's got some size, fourth round draft pick of the Washington Capitals. Um, he has made four starts. He's one and three in those starts uh, with a 913 save percentage for Notre Dame. So. No, not necessarily having a great start, but he is also the only goalie in his age group, uh, American goalie in his age group that's playing college hockey right now. So, you know, I think that that's another thing to take into consideration. I think he's probably the odds on favorite to start for USA in the in, in a few years, but you never know how things are going to progress and which goalies are going to rise, which goalies are going to fall, um, how much more time he gets. But uh, Jake, always appreciate the questions and and thanks for asking it again. But I I, I do think we, you know we'll we'll see it. Augustine Kemp, uh, Augustine Slikinski Kemp this year and Kemp uh, likely to start next season. All right, uh, Blake, who is a Colorado Avalanche fan, asks: I really liked Mikhail Gulayev pick by the Abs in the 2023 draft. How is he doing? Well, Gulayev is still out in uh, in Russia. Um, and I think that he is a, a very intriguing talent, uh, playing in the Omsk system. He's a, he's an, a below average size defenseman. Um, this year, you know, I think he's probably performing at a similar level to what we saw before, but what really stands out to me is less about the numbers. He does have five points so far this season with two goals for Omsk in the KHL, but he's got a number of games so far this season where he's played, you know, close to 20 minutes in, in the game. And so seeing that, seeing that maturation, you know, he's kind of been more of a uh, bottom, you know, mid, you know, kind of second pairing, sometimes bottom pairing. He's getting more looks where he's playing 17, 18, 19, 20 minutes in a game. That's a good progression for him. Um, you know, I think that this is a player that, you know, he's still under contract as far as I know um, in the KHL for next season. I don't know that he's necessarily a candidate like some of these other to leave their contract early. Um, I don't think that that necessarily would be the case. Um, but I, but I think him staying at home and getting another year after this one will be good. I think what you would want to see in terms of progression year over year would be him to be a, a more productive, um, heavier utilized player as he moves forward. But he's he's a he's a really fun skater. He's got skill. He gets pucks to the net, and now he's starting to play more minutes. That's a positive development for him. So not you know he's he's he still has a ways to go to be NHL ready. But I think that that's a player that you you know you bet on the offensive upside that he has. He still is showing that. Doesn't have the numbers right now, but he is playing more and starting to get more opportunity, and that's a good thing. All right. <sighs> If we uh, have a Q&A, we almost always will have a question about Blackhawks prospects. Don't mind it. You guys got a lot to look at because the NHL team, not so good right now. Uh, but Michael asks, uh, is Oliver Moore's drop in production more concerning than Sam Rinzel's jump in production is encouraging? I know point totals aren't everything, especially for a centerman, but Oliver was expected to build off the strong end of last year like Sam is doing. Well, yeah, you know, I think for Oliver Moore, the the issue has always been, you know, how much offense is there ultimately going to be with him? We know he's an elite skater. We know he's solid defensively. We know he's competitive. You know, ultimately, does he have the skill, enough skill? Like, you know, he has eight points in 12 games. I know you'd like him to be a 12, uh, you know, a point per game player at this point. You'd like to see him kind of dictating play a bit more. Um, But at the same time, he's never been a consistent producer. It's never been thing, a thing where he was going to be a, a high-end scorer. The thing that I think Oliver Moore's value to the Chicago Blackhawks is in his versatility and his ability to play on the PK, his ability to 
be a forward on the four check and be an ability to play good defensive hockey as well. Um, he's, you know, physically strong, explosive on the skating front. And yes, if he refines that offensive game, which we've been waiting for him to do for the last couple of years, he will have a bigger opportunity to be a more impactful NHL player. But I still think he does things in the NHL that matter. And, you know, I think he's got a lot of details in his game. You look at where he's at, you know, he's not a, among the top scorers for um, Minnesota, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of veteran players on that team. He's in his second season. You know, there's there's not a lot for me to get concerned about. I think Oliver Moore, to me, has always been about the sum of his entire game and not just one element of it and certainly not the offensive element. Um, and so I think that that's still, still good. On the other side, you've got Sam Renzel, 10 points over 12 games. He's really starting to come into his own offensively. He's getting more confident. He's moving pucks. I think that's a really positive development for Chicago as well. You're starting to say, okay, this is a guy that we we you know can sign, potentially have, you know, go to Rockford for a year, and maybe he's in our in our top, you know, could be a, uh, in our rotation of six defensemen here really soon and maybe playing on one of our power play units and all those different things. So there's a lot to look forward to among those prospects. And I think those two in particular, you know, they are maybe heading different ways production wise, but I think both of them bring something to the table that they were drafted for, you know, and with Renzel, it was all about upside and, and he's shown that upside. And with Oliver Moore, it was about explosive skating versatility. He's still doing that. He's still a guy that can do all those things. And I think at the world junior championship, as we saw last year, get him in that environment. He really thrives. And I think he will again this year, maybe not with the numbers so much, but as the role, I mean, he's a critical piece to team USA's gold medal hopes. All right. We've only got a couple of questions left. This next one comes to us from Jack and Jack asks, hi, Chris analysis of Trevor Connolly's game typically takes a backseat to analysis of his behavior off the ice. Can you please give an overview of what his potential and timeline to the pro game looks like irrespective of his prior bad choices looking forward to what's next? Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's true. I mean, whenever we talk about players that have had some, some issues in the past, we, we have to address them. You know, I think that to, to gloss over them is, is, is irresponsible uh, because it doesn't paint the, the full picture. Um, I think that we've hashed out the Trevor Connolly story quite a bit. Um, and, and so I, you know, I'm comfortable to, to, to go ahead and, and, and talk more about the on ice game. Um, he was still drafted. He was a guy that, you know, is still viewed as a very important piece of a Providence college team. He's still in the mix for the world junior championship. I mean, all of these different things. And, you know, I, I, I think the, the one thing that I find in terms of his on ice game that I still take pause with is decision-making and maturity on the ice. We talk a lot about the issues that have, that, that, that he's kind of dealt with and, and had to answer for, in the years off the ice. But I think the things that, that really stand out to me are more on the ice where, you know, he did get a major penalty recently for cross-checking. It wasn't, you know, it's one of those where it could have, you know, it, it's definitely a, a, a penalty penalized play um, and, and should have been, and it should have come with a steep penalty. Um, and, and those are the things that I do still have concerns about, especially when it comes to the world juniors, but what it comes to, Hockey ability. There's no question in my mind that of the players that are available for the Team USA's World Junior roster, he is among, if not the most talented player. He has speed. He has hands. He has scoring ability. He has hockey sense. He has uh, tenacity on the ice. He has the ability to to turn pucks, you know, get pucks turned over from the other team, and you know, take them away and and create offense. Those are valuable things. But it does come with that caveat that he's going to play on the edge and he might cost you with a, a costly penalty. And in short tournaments like the World Juniors, that matters. In the macro, when you're talking about a, an NHL regular season, if you're a player that plays on the edge and you need to play on the edge to play at the top of your ability, teams are going to live with the penalties that you take. You know, I remember Carl Taylor from the Milwaukee Admirals talked a lot in the, in the last year about how Zach LaRue, who just scored his first NHL goal last week, needs to play on the edge and yes, he's going to get suspended and yes, he's going to get penalties and yes, he's going to hurt us sometimes, but he needs to have that mentality in order to be effective and to be a potential goal scorer so that, that you can live with the bad. If the good is very good. And, and I'm talking strictly on ice with that. 
Um, because there's certainly times that the off ice bad you cannot live with um, and you don't want to. But I think in Connolly's case, it's the on ice bad that you do get, get a little bit of a pause. In terms of his overall NHL prospects, he has top line potential. Um, I have no problem saying that. I think, you know, he's when he's been healthy this year and he's been banged up a bit at Providence, he's been productive. He can take over a game all by himself. He can take over a shift all by himself. He can do all the things that top level players do. It's just that there's always that, but, and I think that that that's, you can't ignore that, but unquestionably to me, if he hits the, te- the peak of his projection, he has every reason to expect that he could be a top line player in the NHL. So clean up some of the other elements and it becomes less and less of a doubt in my mind that he would be a top line player. He's that talented. So that is it. All right. Our final question on talking hockey sense goes to Tommy and Tommy's been a long time listener and Tommy, I always appreciate the kind words and, and certainly appreciate when you chime in with questions. Um, we really do enjoy that. Um, you uh here is your question thank you for this 135th episode i have been listening to all of them fantastic work looking forward to the next chapter do you think victor eklund could go top seven in the draft so eklund is a real interesting player um you know and i think you we've all been talking about anton frondel coming into this season um while in the same organization that he plays in victor eklund has been able to stay healthy and as of right now, he has 14 points in 18 games in the all Um, That is a pretty impressive number that he has there. He had three goals in the U20 event that the that uh, U20 events this season um, for Team Sweden. I think he's a lock for their World Junior team. Um, and you know, I think that it is absolutely possible that he can sneak into that top seven. What I find interesting about this draft class is is not really the lack of consensus, but just, you know, the drop off and where the drop off comes in terms of 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 where things are. Like, I really think that to me, it looks like Hagen's and and, and Martone are clear, you know, clearly above the rest for me um, right now. But Eklund is a player that I think is in that, you know, the next tier of players. You think about guys like, you know, Misa Schaefer, probably a little bit, of, you know, they're they're ahead. Um, but I think that, you know, towards the end of that tier, you're talking about Victor Eklund. And he's a player that I think, you know, he's got a, a good frame. He makes plays. He's a playmaker. Uh, he can score, you know, eight goals already this season uh, and Sweden's second pro division. Um, you know, I think the other thing, he's getting the ice time. He's playing top six minutes for this team. He's getting opportunities to be a, a critical piece to their offensive attack. Um, that's all good. And, and when you do it at a young age and in pro hockey, it says a lot about what you are. Really can't wait to see him at the World Juniors. Can't wait to see what he's going to be able to do. I think he's a really impressive prospect. Um, you know, I think this year it's going to be a real battle within the top 10, top 15 with a lot of differing opinions. And I think Eklund is going to be one of those guys that is in the top half of that conversation um, and, and very well could be a top 10 pick, maybe even a top seven pick, as you mentioned there, Tommy. Um, and, and once again, want to thank you for all the kind words and, and, and everything that uh, being a, a loyal listener um, and, and as so many of you have been uh, from the very beginning. So that's going to do it for our, our final Q and a and uh, Tommy, thank you for uh, being our closer. Um, so, you know, as we get set to, to close the chapter here, uh, on talking hockey sense, and, and I'm going to finish with a few, you know, closing thoughts here on, on the podcast. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit when we thought we were wrapping this podcast up a, a, <laughs> a couple of months ago. Um, you know, we, I, I've been thinking a lot about what this, this show has meant to me, um, and what you, the listeners have meant to me over this time. And that's the thing that I, I find really, um, you know, that that's what I really come back to is that there are some of you that have heard every single episode of this podcast. There are some of you that maybe only listened a few times, or maybe you just popped in when the draft was on, or maybe it was, uh, our world juniors episodes or the things that, you know, we often bring in more listeners. Either way, it's always been fun for me to know that 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 this what we're doing here was resonating with an audience, however big or small it may have been. Um, we are a niche podcast within a niche sport, and uh, we talk about prospects. We talk about college hockey, junior hockey, uh, international hockey. We don't talk about the NHL very much outside of the NHL draft, and so you know we know that the audience that we're going after is 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 smaller than than that, and. 
what I think podcasts do in general is that they just allow you to form a relationship with your listeners. And I, I hope that you guys have felt, you know, like when we've had these times together on the podcast that you've been able to kind of listen and uh, either be entertained or enlightened or educated on something you didn't know. And, and maybe that helped form a little bit of a, of a, of a semi relationship uh, with uh, between the two of us. And, and certainly um, I think that's what makes podcast special is it's a completely different experience between a listener uh, and there's there's a there's a bit of an intimacy to it, which I think doesn't necessarily exist in other mediums, even though we do do this on video. And if you've watched these videos start to finish, God bless you. Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, we'll have video, a video component to our next show as well. Uh, but but I just think that that's been awesome for me to, to experience that. I really, really appreciate when people pop out and say, you know, love the podcast or, you know, hey, listen to the show like, like that a lot. Really enjoying it. Um, I, I've heard from people that said, hey, you know, I didn't really dis I didn't really agree with that, you know, but I love that. It was always respectful disagreement. It was never, hey, you're an idiot, which I very well could be. I really, you know, I who knows? I mean, I, I like to pretend uh, at least to, at least to know, to think, I know that I, I, I think I know what I'm doing, but who knows? Uh, but really, I think it's been great to, to hear from people that, that have enjoyed the podcast. I also think since we moved to flow, um, you know, the audience has continued to grow. It's you've interacted with the podcast a lot of different ways through video, um, through other mediums, um, and, and on our platform as well and on our app. So, you know, I, I think that that's been great and hopefully that you you've liked that. But the one thing I did want to say, and, and, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. When I first started this podcast, it was in a, in a very difficult time for me personally, because I had lost my dream job. As many of you know, I was at ESPN. Uh, the pandemic came along and that ended a lot of our jobs uh, there, including mine right before the uh, they got the NHL right. So, you know, it was kind of doubly crushing in that way because it was about to be this big moment um, in, in ESPN's history for hockey. And certainly I thought in my career and in the end, it was a, an abrupt shift. And one of the first things I knew I was going to do when that job ended and when I was trying to discover, you know, to figure out what the heck was next for me was, you know, if I'm going to do a sub stack and whatever else, but I knew I would do a podcast. And, and I, you know, in the early days of this podcast, we had a lot more guests and, you know, it just became difficult with the, the other duties that I had to book people and, 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 and arrange things. And we, you know, we have schedules and everything, but I think back to some of those conversations that I had with, with those great people, you know, Bob McKenzie was our first guest, Emily Kaplan and I had a great conversation about, you know, mental health in, in the, in our careers as well. Um, you know, Elliot Friedman, was uh was was on and we talked about you know empathy and reporting and different things of these you know these bigger topics and you know i've had a chance to interact with some of my very close friends ryan clark brad schlossman Corey prime and um you know on this podcast guys that are you know life friends where we could have these conversations that we have in private and bring them out in front of you um you know so those have all been meaningful as well so this has been a lot of fun for me and i hope that it was fun for you guys um I'm not sad because I get to continue talking to you on a weekly basis. It'll just be under a new name, uh, a new format, and there will be another voice on the podcast, which I think is good and necessary, and I think it'll make this show better. Um, you guys have hung in there with me as I have talked to myself for so many episodes, and as much as I love the sound of my own voice, I am constantly shocked by those that also feel the same way and at least tune in each week. So uh, I thank you all for doing that. But this has already gone on far too long because it's not really a goodbye. It's just a kind of turning of the page. Uh, we'll be back in a few weeks with a new show, with a new format, and with so much more. Uh, I hope you guys will stick around. Flow Hockey has given us a great opportunity here to continue um, coming into your, your earbuds every weekend and then also uh, joining you on video and on your TVs and wherever you may be watching from but i really do appreciate everybody that has taken the uh, the time to listen has taken the time to ask questions i appreciate all the guests i've had over the years i appreciate everyone that has hopped on as a producer that has uh that has helped make this show go and has bared with me as i talk to myself every week so uh it's been great and uh, uh, so a special thanks to josh who's producing today's final episode uh, and has produced many of these since we've been at flow. So uh, very, very appreciative of all of uh, their efforts and, and, and everyone there. And again, 
it's uh it's not goodbye it's just uh we'll see you in a different uh a different house or something like that when we when we move to the new show and that will be coming soon stay tuned to flow hockey to get all the information about the new program um also make sure that you stay tuned to your podcast app of choice uh we'll make sure we get you those links so that you can subscribe to the new podcast um and Make sure you leave a kind rating and review on that so that we can continue to grow uh, and get uh, get things going. But we will be back under the new banner very, very soon. Uh, but it has been a lot of fun for 135 episodes to come uh, do this show, to talk to you guys about prospects, and uh, really excited about the next chapter. So I hope that you guys will will join us for it. So, yeah, for the final time, uh, this is Chris Peters, and uh, this has been Talking Hockey Sense, and we will we will see you soon. Thanks, everybody.